Okay, sorry. Uh, what about the uh, of the congregation of the law? Uh, can female conduct marry a uh, priest? Um, and there uh, is a biological link uh, necessary to establish ancestry. And therefore, can convert uh, can recite liturgical praises that include the words of Father, like a level ten. Were the children of converts consider Israelites unconditionally, or was the status of, or was the status of the gear transmitted from generation to generation? If the latter, uh, were the offspring of converts uh, regarded differently from well-established Jews? Our sources present contrasting opinions on each of these questions. That is to say, after the fourth century CE, there was no consensus among the sages about uh, the status of converts in Israel. Today, I wish to discuss the possible Roman context for one of the opinions in these rabbinic debates. Indeed, a number of recent studies highlight the influence of Roman laws and the discussed civil status on Alaha. In that context, Roman citizenship has been suggested as one of the paradigms the shaped rabbinic um, approaches to conversion. For example, Moshe Lavi uh, views rabbinic conversion as a fusion of biblical Greco-Roman and Persian models. He regarded the Greco-Roman source uh, wait, um, a, as, as a civic model that evolved from the Greek polis to its latter forms of citizenship in imperial Roman settings. Such Greco-Roman perceptions seems to supply a framework for considering Jewishness as a membership in an imagined political entity, Israel, and understanding belonging to a group as being subject to its legal system. Despite this general understanding of our Roman concept of citizenship affected the rabbinic notion of conversion and more generally uh, of belonging to Israel. The halacha regarding the status of converts, namely what's happened to converts after they converted, was rarely uh, analyzed in light of Roman laws, norms, and sentiments. Regarding new citizens, regarding new citizens, rather, a conversion was mostly viewed as an internal Jewish procedure, and the different rabbinic stances were usually analyzed by terms of stringency and leniency, and also by considering which sages were more supportive of converts and saw them positively. In several recent articles, I suggested that looking at these sources and especially uh, the different analytic stances through prisms of legal models explain the sources better than try to categorizing them according to stringency and leniency. Today, I want to focus on one of these models, the Roman Friedman. Uh, uh, while, while in each of my uh, paper, I study one aspect of this debate, I, I use like each picture of them was considered one of the questions I uh, discussed before. Um, I, today, I want to tie some of these elements together to suggest a broader picture on how the status of the Roman Friedman may impact uh, this discussion. Uh, as inhabitants of the Roman Empire, the sages of the land of Israel were familiar with Roman laws regarding free slaves who could become citizens of, upon manumission. Against this backdrop, I suggest that the sages integrated these standards to formulate new categories and regulation which class, when classifying the status of converts. First, uh, let us say a few words about the status of freedmen uh, in Rome. Mm. Um, okay. If manumitted menu properly, Roman freed slaves become, became Roman citizens. Such integration uh, of former slaves was unique in the ancient world. Freed slaves were on par with long standing Roman citizens in most areas of life, except for some differences regarding the status and position in society. Here I want, I will mention three of the central uh, matters. Uh, first, 
um, a legal relationship with, uh, with a member, uh, with family member. Freed slaves had no legal relationship with their children who were born before they were manumitted. Um, second, um, position of authorities. Um, uh, freedmen were banned from exercising public authority. As Henry K. Morrison wrote, uh, the taboo against former slaves exercising public authority was absolute and non negotiable, justified, uh, justified as it was by the natural order that dictates that higher beings governed by the governed the lawyers. As a result, freedmen were excluded from the entire honor systems, including including magistracies, priesthoods, the Senate, the equestrian order, the law courts, and the local town courts, and the local uh, town councils. And third, marriage. Uh, with respect, uh, uh, okay. With respect to the lower social uh, strata, Roman citizens, uh, were prohibited from marrying certain people, such as prostitutes and kings. But former slaves were not subjected to these standards. Um, concerning the upper strata of society, a law by Augustus prescribed women freed slaves from marrying senators and at least three generations of their male offspring. Thus, select marital restrictions were imposed on, uh, on freed slaves. Roman freed persons were in a liminal position. They were new citizens, although with particular limitation and liberties in relation to marriage. Yet, from a legal point of view, their children were equal uh, to any other Roman born to free parents. Significantly, uh, these three areas where Romans, uh, where Roman freed slaves differed from long-standing Roman citizens, are also the area where converts and free slaves um, were different from long-standing Israelites, according to the Mishnah and the Tosefa. Despite these similarities between approaches to status in al and Roman law, I would argue that the, the Roman freedmen model seems to have been instrument, instrumental for developing perspective on Jewish converts. Before trying to demonstrate this hypothesis, let me say a few words about freed slaves in al -Akha. Freeing a non-Jewish slave who would then become Jewish is an invention that does not appear in the Hebrew Bible. Moreover, the Tanakh does not envision the elimination of foreigner slaves. So, for example, Leviticus differentiates Israelite slaves who are, who are ultimately freed from non-Israelite slaves whose, whose enslavement, enslavement is permanent. However, according to rabbinic literature, servitude within a Jewish household offered an avenue for non-Jews to join Judaism. In the case of male slaves, circumcision was a requirement for service in a Jewish household. Yet conversion was completed only after a slave had been manumitted. We may conclude that just like a slave of a Roman citizen who became Roman citizen upon manumission, so too a slave of a Jewish master became Jewish. Indeed, since this uh, process resemble, resemble the Roman practice, it has been suggested that rabbinic laws from minimated non jewish slaves reflect this Roman model. Numerous scholars have also remarked that rabbinic legal texts often pair converts with freed slaves. They have explained this pairing by, posit by positing that since freed slaves join Judaism Upon minimation, much, much as convert, converts did, freed men and women, women were legally categorized like, like converts. In contrast to these, uh, to the scholars who, uh, wait, 
In contrast to the scholar who have explained the legal status of converts was applied to freed persons who had served in Jewish homes, for they too became Jewish upon minimation, I propose a more complex and a time inverse dynamic. Roman laws and concepts regarding freedmen and freed women offered, offered a legal framework that in, uh, influenced certain elements of rabbinic halacha concerning converts. Thus, the apparent clustering of converts at freedmen in rabbinic texts may not only indicate that freedmen and women were deemed similar to converts, as both uh, groups became Jewish, but the Roman, uh, the, the Roman treatment of freedmen provided a conceptual approach for defining the status of converts in rabbinic law. Let us return to the three uh, dissimilarities between long-standing Roman citizens uh, and freed slaves and briefly compare them to Tanaitic Kalacha. First, uh, the legal relationship between um, between male converts um, and their offspring who were born before their conversion and in some cases joined Israel with one or both parents. According to Canaitic sources, in this instance, family bonds between the father and his children were severed, even if both the generation converted together and they are no longer deemed as hers. It is unclear why Tanaitic Alcha does not acknowledge the ties between a father and his offspring when they all converted together. Elsewhere, I explain why there was a differentiation between convert's father and convert's mother, mothers on this issue. Here, I want to focus on how the convert is imagined. The Pozzolite is portrayed as lacking hers, therefore the first Israelite to take all of the possession of such a deceased convert would consider the new owner. Indeed, several tenetic passages address the case of um, a convert who died without heirs, a ger shemet ve'en or, sim or simply discuss the one who take possess possession of a convert's property, machzik benichse ger, another place that appears in Tosefta and later sources uh, is a convert who died and Israelite distrib uh, distributed his property, Ger Shemet Bizbezu Israelit Mechasav. An additional example in Tosefta Baba Batra, appearing uh, in Tosefta Baba Batra, Goy Veved Abau al Bat Israel, Afilu Chazar al Goy Venit Geir, Eved Venishtacher, Mechasav, Kenichse Ager, Kenichse Eved Meshukar, Kol Kodem Brem Zachar. A gentle or a slave who had sexual intercourse with an Israelite woman, woman even, even if the gentile later converted and the slave was limited, their property is like the property of a convert and the property of a freed slave. Whoever came early and, and take possession of it, uh, gain. Uh, like uh, in numerous other Canaanitic sources here too, the converts and the freed slaves appear together and have similar status. They have no legal relations with their offspring who were conceived before the change in their status. The law does not acknowledge their ties with, their, with uh, these children. Moreover, although there were converts and freedmen who had children after they converted on, or minimated, and therefore have, have legitimate heirs by default, Converts are being imagined as uh, desolates and without family ties. As mentioned above, according to Roman law, two freed slaves had no legal ties with children they conceived before their minimation. Uh, second, position of authority. According to the Mishnah, Girim are banned from sitting in the Sanhedrin, judging capital cases and giving instruction uh, as well as holding other position of authority. It seems that the issue here is lineage. Um, let us look at uh, one example for the Mishnah. Um, if a court gave instruction and one of them um, were, were a convert, a mamzer, and a teen or an elder without children, they are exempt. For it is stated here, a dying, it states here, there a die, you can have the, 
the biblical verses from the NL, uh, just as uh, in the case of Eda is mentioned there, all of them are qualified for in, in, issuing instruct, instruction. So for a soft tooth for Eda that is mentioned here, unless all of them are qualified for issuing instruction. This text considers a scenario where the public uh, unintentionally transgress a law from the Torah due to an error of legal uh, directive. Based on the reading of Leviticus uh, 4, 13 and 14, in such case, a court should bring a bull as a sin offering. If the court is not valid, it, it is exempt from this sacrifice, but each Israelite who sinned by following its ruling should bring a sin offering. Mishnah Rayot lists uh, several parameters that would uh, render a court unfit. Among them, the inclusion of a member who was not qualified to give instruction. According to this passage, four categories of men are ineligible to issue a lachic ruling. The first three, the convert from Zeran Atin, are excluded because of their ancestry. The Yerushalmi's treatment uh, of this uh, Mishnah also highlights lineage. Um, it stated um, that they may uh, stand there with you, just as you are neither a convert and a teen or a mamzer, so too they are neither converts, netinim, mamzerim, or slaves. Here, the Talmud modified the groups that are disqualified from joining this code, substituting the slave for the childless. This shift framed this as a prohibition based on per degree. But by proceeding this list with a question, quotation from Numbers 11.16, this passage stressed the importance of lineage, just as Moses was neither convert, natin, mazer, or slave, uh, and thus, without genealogical flu, so too were the elder who get her beside the tabernacle. While the Talmud used the word slaves here, it's possible that it's actually referred to free slaves, and I'm not spent here well. Uh, as was mentioned before, just like uh, these opinions in the Mishnah and the Yerushalmi, in Roman law, freedmen were legally banned from um, an array of public walls. Uh, the third, uh, the similarity, and maybe the most important, um, is the convert status in marriage. Uh, the Mishnah and the Tosefta uh, each list uh, a group, uh, groups within the Jewish people that are based on lineage. In that hierarchy, priests have the highest standards, standing, followed by the Levites and Israelites. The lower strata include Mamzerim. These passages detail the possibility of marriage between the, these groups. Uh, well, the upper uh, categories are defined as belong to the congregation of the Lord, or Ka'al in Ibu, which we discussed uh, yesterday. The lower groups cannot marry into it. Uh, the Tanay debate uh, where can converts should be situated within this ranking. This debate about the status of converts in marriage revolved around, around two issues. First, can the daughter of Gurim or even Giort uh, herself, if converted in an early age, <coughs> marry a priest? And second, can converts marry Mamzerim and other groups that are banned from marrying into the Ka'al? This second issue is often articulated by the question of whether a convert should be considered as part of the Ka'al. Here, I will present only one example that show how the Roman Friedman model may help to understand the, Mish the Mishnah. Uh, Mishnah Kiddushin um, 41 lists 10 categories that are based on ancestry within the Jewish uh, people. Um, 10 genealogical classes came up from Babylonia, priests, Levites, Israelites, Chalalei, Chalalim, converts, free slaves, on Zerim, Natinim, Shtukim, and Sufi. This uh, Mishnah assumed that these classes 
who maintained long after Israelites returned from Babylonia. Thus, rather than being single generation designations, these descriptions also applied to future offspring. offspring. Thus, status was uh, broadly transmitted from the father to his children. Now, let us, uh, uh, let us look at this Mishnah, uh, how this Mishnah regulates marriage within this group within, uh, with, social, with special attention to converts. Uh, I'm only reading from B to D. A, a, priest leaves, a, a, a priest leaves Israelites are permitted to marry each other. Levites, Israelites, Chalalei, converts, freed slaves are permitted to marry each, each other. Converts, freed slaves, Manzerei, the teenage to Kayan Sufei are permitted to marry each other. Mishnah Kedushin 4.1 associate converts with freed slaves while assigning them a unique position within Israel. They are banned from marrying priests, but permitted to wed Israelites, Levites, and Halalim, the rest of the congregation of the Lord, as well as the lower groups, Mamzerim, Netinim, Shtukim, and Asufim, who are not allowed to marry into the congregation. And although this source conceptualized social relation without using the term, the term ka'al, by implication, this ruling place converts, places converts outside of the congregation for they, for they are free to wear do, these, those who are pro prohibited from its member, members, yet they are permitted <coughs> to marry into the ka'al, except for priests. This liminal position of converts and freed slaves resembles the station of Roman freedmen and freed women. These new Romans were not permitted to wed senators, but they were eligible to marry other Romans, including those that were freeborn citizens who were proscribed from marrying. These restrictions and leniencies had legal force and reflected social norms. It is telling that the Mishnah situa situates the freed men and, and women uh, in the same category with converts. We may conclude that in the case of marriage too, the Roman Friedman model seems to have been useful for developing perspectives on Jewish converts. So far, I show the three of the area in which Roman freed slaves differ from long-standing Roman citizens. Uh, they are also where converts and freed slaves were different from long standing Israelites, according to the Mishnah and the Sefer. These are, of course, several, there are, of course, several differences between the status of converts and freed slaves in Al Ha and the status of freed slaves in Roman law. And I discuss them elsewhere, as, as well as other legal models that were used for thinking about the status of converts. I didn't bring you here all the debates and all the other. Um, contrasting opinion, which use other models. And yet, in this paper, I try to show that this model is useful for considering the status of converts in genetic uh, sources. Finally, I would like to conclude with a question. Why choose this model? Or in other words, why this framework may be useful for imagining the integration of converts into Israel? Why not to use like regular uh, new Roman citizens which uh, directly receive all the rights of Roman citizens. I will mention you only uh, two preliminary thoughts, and if you have other ideas, I would love to hear. First, in the Roman world, slavery would erase one ethnicity and form of family and local ties, while other new Roman citizens would, would preserve their connection with their families and hometowns the freed slave is imagined as a blank slave. <coughs> Thus, freedmen would adopt the new culture and is inspired to belong to it. Choosing this framework fits the concept that converts just like a slave in Jewish home is considered as a blank slate. Second, this framework offers a model for a gradual integration into Israel. This is to say, 
While the current status of freed slaves was dissimilar to that of long-standing Roman citizens, and a stigma of serv servitude could not be erased, their children were considered at, legal, at least legally equal to any other Roman citizen. This model offers an avenue for integration of the next generation. While the genetic sources reflect a debate over the status of the offspring of Gerim, which I did not discuss today, you can read it on other articles. Uh, those who chose this model seems to do so because it provides a framework to think about the integration of converts into Israel. Thus, despite their current in, uh, inferior status, there is a prospect of full membership, at least for the next generation. Thank you. Some questions, comments? Maybe I'll start off. Um, I think it's the, first of all, it's, it's very, very uh, interesting similarities that you point out. Um, and I think that one, one direction that it points us in is thinking about conversion as actually more of a, a political action than a religious one, right? Because when you think about what, what's the main benefit of the freed slave, it's more of a political benefit, right? You change your political status. And, and by drawing together these two institutions in rabbinic literature, then the rabbis are also suggesting that entering the covenant of mitzvot is actually, it's a political status. It's not just a religious question between um, man and God, but it's actually about politics. So I just wanted to see if you thought about that. If you, um, you know, where where do you think that that? The question: What do you consider politics? Because you know, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it entails. I think to me, what's fascinating about it is that it entails thinking differently in general about the system of mitzvot as a whole, not just about the convert. Right, but in general, what is the role of performing mitzvot? Mm -hmm. So I think it's you know it, it seems to cohere with thinking about um, that system not as a religious system, but as a system that also is a system that has political benefits. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> other questions? Yes. Um, uh, two two comments. Uh, one, first, I think the, the, the to consider the um, manumission as as a model that preceded the conversion and not vice versa. That first converts are like manumitted slaves, rather than slaves are like manumitted, uh, rather than manumitted slaves are like converts. I think it's really it's 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 a direction. It's a very promising direction. Okay. And. Um, and especially if we think about captivity as a kind of an archetype for conversion uh, laws in halachic midrashim. So those biblical uh, texts which refer to war and captives and the beautiful captive lady. Uh, and she is that, Leo, which is like the fator is, yes. Which gives us a hint that maybe the earliest layers in rabbinic literature were speaking we were speaking about about um, manumission um, and the archetypes for conversion are coming from there. Um, even even the tradition about uh, Abraham who is converting, which is based on his household, his household was actually his slaves. Okay, um, so so there is something there. Um, and uh, the other comment is, uh, is, is maybe something about uh, um, academic confidence and academic uh, castration, I would even say, that um, in, in my book, there is no chapter about this subject because um, I got very- I, 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 I cut, I, I had another sentence, but they have to cut the lecture yeah, but... to make it. And this sentence was, uh, Mushal pointed to this direction is dissertation, but didn't pursue it. Yeah. So that's that. <laughs> and, 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 and I want to say that I had like one of at least one of my of my uh, of of my readers was very negative about this chapter, 
I know now that he was wrong, but, <laughs> but it really, it, it silenced me. And I didn't went back to the subject ever. Well, so it's, yeah. uh, it's important yeah, to tell something. I, I want to, to say yeah, something. Yeah, cool. I don't know. I don't think it's, it's a record. So not a... <laughs> uh, it's a good reminder that it's, it's still recording, but I can only say that there is a lot of opposition for uh, largely in Israel, like in, especially in, among scholar of what's called Mishpat Ivri, mm -hmm. uh, to the idea that uh, there was Roman influence and there is a, a lot of objection to that. And maybe the question is how we define uh, influence because mm -hmm. it's not the same. They don't imitate everything. It's only like a model they use and the, the outcome is, is not exactly the same. It's not the copying this. So the question is what you try to, to, you know, to show, to whether you need to show that uh, every detail and everything is really, really similar. And if not, there is no connection between the Roman world and al or it's enough to show some some similarities to, and, and to say that push, it's a context. And, and this is why I really admire the way you put it. You said Roman law helps us to understand the way the, the things are in the Mishnah. Instead of arguing for we can establish influence, no, we have a system, we have another system, we see the parallelism, and it, it is insightful, and that's enough. I actually want to yeah. strengthen Moshe's point, and I think that's important, and you, you, you really talk about genre of studying Roman law and its connection to rabbinic sources. And I think we're, we suffer from Lieberman. We have, we have a Moreshet, uh, we have a way of looking at the, uh, Lieberman gave us the, the parameters to work with Roman law. He said it had to be terms, it had to be, um, you know, certain, uh, and if it's not that, for example, his, his research on the Yudimil Midot, right? He says, since I didn't find uh, exactly that, there's no connection. You, but you actually say, well, he, he's very honest about what he says because he wants to keep Judaism, the real Judaism, separate from the influences. He he gave us the way of how to look at the story. It's not the same. And I think the way, in, in, in a sense, that, uh, and I can, I'm kind of referring to a sentence that Suzanne Stone said uh, about this morning session. And she said, uh, when you're talking about law, uh, the gap between the, what the minister was doing and what we're doing was more, you know, he, he, he wants to talk about halakha as a normative, what do you do tomorrow morning when we wake up and we were talking about the law as a, as a system of concepts, as a system of way of looking at the world around us and trying to navigate through it. Uh, and so it's not the same law, right? So, so Suzanne said, when, you, when you're talking about studying the law, how do you do it? And I, I, I joined Moshe in saying this is a good way of framing it. And it doesn't have to be um, either that or that. And it, it doesn't even have to go to the there was a period where uh, people did more uh, uh, hermeneutics or, or anthropology of uh, uh, religions in context, and they went to this fluffy area to avoid it. And I think you're 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 saying no, we can say more. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend the anthropologist, but I think that's <laughs> uh, but, but, but I say really, you can actually do legal uh, legal reading of the text without. You know, saying it has to be copied for that, and I want to give as an example the work of uh, of Yelit uh, and uh, and um, oh, wait. Oh, wait. Maka, sorry, I'm tired. Uh, uh, and that they're, I think they're doing uh, something similar when they're looking at other concepts, and I think this this is a good direction to go. And we have to be aware that what the methodology that we're taking and what exactly we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, um, I'm Adam. Sorry, I wasn't here until now. I've been already enjoying it very much. And um, to continue this wonderful uh, uh, direction, uh, the specific case that you're bringing is, is, is a wonderful example. But I think that if we broaden this beyond uh, legal studies or beyond ancient, I mean, this, this in a way, it's very um, contemporary in terms of kind of a postmodernist turn in terms of not needing binaries um, and being able to look at a spectrum of possibilities. But I think methodologically, this is a very important thing that you're, that you're, that you're bringing to a fore here, which is uh, my favorite part of your talk was when you got the dissimilarity. 
I mean, that was it. Because, yeah, that was great to see the similarities. And then you said, okay, I'm not stopping there. If I stop there, it's kind of like, okay, that's cool. We found some. some so in the end of the day, your subject is Jewish conversion or rabbinic conversion or in any subject that we do. And so often people think that the, the novel, novelty is to say, well, you see, there's things that like that. And it's kind of, I don't know, I think it, 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 you take it and, and this whole trend is really where, where we want to go as scholars. We want to be able to say something in the end of the day about our subject and using uh, parallels, using other types of um, cultures or, or, or data that can help enlighten us about our own depth. So it's wonderful. And thank you for, for making that piece uh, essential to your talk. Thank you. <laughs> other comments? Okay, so join me in thanking the other guests. Um, so other than talking about in this session about the land of Israel versus Babylonia, uh, the next talk is also going to um, take us to a different, different direction. We have the converts entering the people of Israel, and then we have the apostates who are leaving but want to return also. Um, so our next speaker is Avram Yoskovich. Avram is a scholar of Talmudic literature and Babylonian Gaonic literature, interreligious interactions, and Jewish legal history. Currently, he's a postdoc fellow in the literary lab at Ben Gurion University and in the project Adama, Late Antique Jewish Geography at the University of Haifa. Avraham also serves as the executive director of Okinta, an online journal of rabbinic studies. And the, title, <laughs> and the title of his talk is Apostates for Believers the challenge of returning apostates in Babylonian Judaism and Syria to Christianity. Thank you very much for the presentation. And that's, that's the place and time to uh, invite everybody to send the two more papers. And there is a great editor there. So, and <laughs> I think I'm going to give you more reason uh, and time to discuss parallel money. Uh, but I'll, I'll begin uh, the beginning. In this lecture, I wish to discuss the phenomenon of reverting apostates, Jews who have left, Jews and later Christians uh, who have left the fold and now wish to return to the Jewish community or their uh, Christian uh, original community. I will do this by examining the attitude of the community leaders toward the returnees and the ritual upon which they returned uh, was possible. This is, soon be apparent from the writings of the Gernim, uh, reverted apostates were related differently than converts, though there is some similarity. I will present some Jewish, uh, Jewish Gernim sources from the Abbasi period and compare them with Eastern Christianity sources, mostly from the same period and deal with close issues. Clearly, there are much more sources to learn together than, okay, than I can show here. But I've tried to present some markers uh, for describing this uh, phenomena and uh, their possible uh, attitudes. Cases of individuals who became estranged from the community and later want to return to it touch upon the fund fundamental definition of the identity and of emotions of both the individual and the community. Therefore, there, these cases enable us to see what uh, what are, uh, are the various uh, leaders or, or writers perceived as the components of community identity, the attitude toward these people, and the possibilities of leaving the community or to return to it. The case of an apostate who wishes to, to return to his original community is a relatively huge. Until the Gaelic period, apostate or the Hebrew word meshumad was not used as a term connoting to exclusion of the individual from the community, the meaning of the origin term and its develop, development were discussed in my dissertation. Uh, it's, it is obscuring us in some sense, still it's obscure. However, up until the Muslim period, sources do not indicate that the term Shumat refers to a person who is no longer part of the community. The explanation for that is not for now, I can just mention the development of uh, Christianity and the citizenship uh, Roman and world as possible elements of, of explanation. However, Gaonic literature reflects a change in this 
uh, situation in the Muslim era. Several discussions and questions arise in connection with the phenomenon of Jew who became a Mishumad and subsequently returned. The sources rarely mention the circumstances of the person's apostasy, but based on other sources, it is reasonable, reasonable to assume that the Geonim are referring to Jews who converted to Islam. These questions make the impression of natural and necessary in situation in, in daily life situation where one converted to Islam and returned to the Judaism or to Christianity in other sources. It is also reasonable to assume that had question, uh, question as this existed in the Talmudic era, they would have been referred to in, in Talmudic writings. But we cannot find such uh, similar discussions earlier in Talmudic uh, sources. One more, one more word of uh, introduction. The challenge facing community leaders when a person sinned and left the fold and later wishes to return is composed of conflicting emotions and tendencies. On the one hand, the leaders were, were happy about the addition of another person to the community, especially when it is the person who left and wishes to return. In the overt competition between religions in the Fertile Crescent under Islamic rule, the act of rejoining the community was viewed as admitting a mistake and constituted a small victory, at least small, uh, of the minority community over the dominant majority and over other rival communities. On the other hand, the return raises a clear suspicion and suspicion and sincerity are playing a major role in our discussion today and in this, uh, in this field. When a person is inconsistent about his identity, his peers may question his motives. Perhaps this is a person who will harm in the social religious climate, which the community leaders are investing so much effort to maintain. As we notice in the moment today, uh, issues of suspicious and, and uh, sincere uh, are very important in, in many, many writings uh, along the different generations. In addition, the desire to, to return and rejoin the community shines a spotlight on another question of identity. Can a person cast off the cloak of community, uh, of community membership, and again die, die it upon himself as he pleases? Does a remnant of a former connection with the community remains, or is he, is he identical to a newcomer uh, who never belonged uh, before to the community? Practical questions which arise in light of this uh, complexity include what must the apostate do in order to rejoin what is uh, reasonable to require from the, uh, for this person and, and, in order, and harm the community in the past in order to prevent potential future damage. Let us read a um, few attempts to answer this question. Rav Avon Gaon, who was the head of the Sura Academy in the middle of the ninth century, wrote a response to the following question, questions. But first, they relate to the um, similarity or uh, dissimilarity to the conduct. The question was, should the, uh, it, it is a number four in your handout. Should the Mashumad wishing to return receive lashings? Perhaps it should require to immerse in a ritual bath. And third, is one allowed to eat in his company due to the concern that he might feed other un uh, unkosher food? Or should he simply be trusted without lashings and immersion? In his answer, Rav Amon Gaon distinguishes, distinguishes explicitly between this case and the case of a convert. The convert must emerge since he was born outside the holiness of Judaism. This principle is accepted among all the Onim and affirms the genealogy, gen, genealogical component. A person born into the Jewish nation returns a component of belonging which doesn't disappear when he transgresses Jewish law. That was the dominant opinion. However, if you skip to, the, to number seven in the handout, there was one exceptional opinion in this regard, um, relating to Rav Falto Igaon, who was the head of the Shibaku Kedita, in parallel uh, years to Rav Amon Gaon, ruled that in a case where a leadership suspects that the returnee is a fraud, they may, uh, they may administer lashes and even require immersion. However, even our Falto states outright that legally, in principle, it is unnecessary. We will return to these uh, uh, answers uh, soon. <coughs> so what is ritually or other uh, require uh, of the reverting process? A related variety of opinions exist among those 
reply to this question. I will soon offer some examples, all of which are creative and suggest original practices. The responses in this method can be split into two categories, a regular rep a repentant uh, Shumad and a priest, a Kohen, who is a repentant in Shumad. Let us begin with the first example in Rav Latunai's Gaon uh, answer, uh, source number five in the handout. Rav Latunai Gaon, who lived also, uh, was also the head of the Sura Academy, that uh, he would allow that a priest who became a Meshumad loses his priestly status, and even if he repents, his status of, as, as a priest is that of a layman. He loses his, his status as a priest. This means that he does not raise up his hands nor recite the priestly blessing during the prayer service. He's not eligible to take precedence in sacred community rituals, for example, being called up to the Torah first. Despite this, he, Ramat Ronai says that he doesn't lose his right to eat halak, which is a, a donation that the priest, the, the Kohen, a, a privilege to, uh, to get, and has the right to, re to receive the compensation for this priestly gift. The duality of the Tunai's response seems surprising. The social aspect of the, of the priesthood, which is, includes financial privileges, is not irreversible, irreversibly damaged. So that when a priest returns, he's still eligible to receive his priestly gifts. On the other hand, is considered as an idolater and loses his priestly status, which was also acquired through his genealogy. This source reflects a duality, which occurs in connection uh, with a variety of issues in Rav Natonai's writings about apostates. I believe it manifests, I, I cannot serve you the whole uh, other uh, answers of uh, Rav Natonai, but I, I believe it manifests a modification which enabled uh, Jewish uh, scholars uh, to avoid irreversible steps. As opposed to Rav Natonai Gaon, the later author of Rav Hai Gaon, who died in uh, 1038, was uh, of the opinion that the reverting priest is permitted to recite the priestly blessing, source number six in your handout. Now, I states that the, the two repentance, which takes place uh, publicly and not in secret, leads to the unlimited, unlimited acceptance. It deals strictly with those who, dis who deride the sinner attempting to repent and declares that they, they the, uh, the, the riders, they are not, uh, and other writing sinners should be excommunicated. The vibe of Ravai's Ravai response is entirely different from uh, Natonai's own. He writes that the principle, uh, in principle, the door is always open to one who left Gaizen as long as his return is honest and loyal, once again, sincerity. But his assumption is different. His attitude is, is much more um, um, inviting. He loses nothing, nothing of his uh, sacred status, status as a Jew, or if he's a priest, he doesn't lose his priestly status and is eligible for any community position. We can conclude that according to Harai Gaon, genealogy rules. Essentially, no identity change has occurred and no new procedure is necessary to uh, reinstate the reverting apostate into the congregation. As I said before, Rav Paltoy, in source number seven, who served, as, uh, was also in Kupedita, in academy, I said it already, parallel uh, to Ratonai and Rav Amor Gaon, uh, ruled that if the leadership deems, deems it necessary, they may require lashes and immersion. Now, Rav Amor Gaon went even further and declaring that is declaring that the reverting apostates receive lashes and also stand before the community and confess his sins, as he says in source number eight. Even though he receives lashes, he must still stand in public and confess to what he did and regret the evil deeds which he performed. And once he has done it, this, it is assumed that he has fully repented and there is no need to suspect any deception on his part and it is permitted to eat and drink with him. Although our Amman does indeed represent the most extreme opinion, it is important to emphasize that all the ideas mentioned in other Gaonic responses are novel and original in Jewish literature. They are not based on any source of, uh, in earlier literature with regard to Mishumadim. As in other fields, the Gaonim had, had to deal with a new reality and borrowed principles and ideas from other more or less similar areas in order to tackle the phenomenon, phenomenon of reverting apostates. 
Moshe um, called it uh, dominantization, of, uh, but you, you refer it in the Babylonian Talmud and you can see it uh, in, others, in later sources. Let us read some Christian scholars about the issue. Jacob of Edisa, uh, source number nine, was a prominent uh, late seventh century scholar. He relates to the divine curse or punishment in his response regarding a convert, a Christian convert to Islam or pagan, returning to Christianity. After saying that the second baptize is not needed and that the reverting Christian uh, need time before uh, he participates in the, in the, commun uh, in the communion, he rules that the sinner reverting to the Christianity shall be considered as an evil servant on the day of judgment and will be is sentenced to eternal fire. This is despite the duty to accept him back into the fold in his life for all purposes. We can find here also the duality um, of the writer. This is despite the, uh, uh, this response set rigid borders between communities since even rejoining the sector, believing community does not enable those who were heretics in their past to escape the fire of hell. In a, in a competitive uh, sense, it appears that this stance is not an invited one. According to Jacob of Elisa, the community is not interested in outsiders joining. However, the answer is significant with regard to the deterrence uh, it, it, uh, it makes uh, uh, toward uh, its uh, members. It clarifies that Jacob's Christian community uh, to, the, to the community members that the implication of joining a pagan and or Muslim community is irreversible. There is, it is a path of no return. Another writer, Isha Banun, who served as the patriarch of Baghdad between 820 to 824, which is only about 30 years before Rabbi Ponai is gone and Rabbi Amal gone, uh, who were in Sura, which is near Baghdad. He was also asked about a man in a clerical position who became a non believer in Jesus, but later wished to return. So he says, uh, source number 10 if a person, priest or deacon, denied Jesus, uh, uh, the Messiah, and then reverted and requested and returned, he must remain in, in his repentant state for a long time. Then, when he is accepted back, he cannot serve in any clerical capacity, but rather as a layman. Ishobanun explains that the revocation of the man's clerical position is necessary in order to ascertain the sincerity of his return. The issue of suspicion clearly led to the decision. But this issue, Barnum, limits, limits the decision in some, in some way. If the leader of the church feels that the repentance is sincere, then there is hope that the cleric will be reinstated in the community. The content of the Patriarch uh, Baghdad answers appears to be a sharp, in sharp contrast to the response of the, of the, the both Jewish schools uh, of the Gironi. As we saw, the Tronai Gaon ruled that the priest is not permitted to continue serving, while Ravai allowed priests to serve without any limit. The Tronai emphasized the component of the sanctity, not the suspicion, that the priest left after, uh, uh, after his uh, apostasy. The priest act due to his uh, deviation from the correct path, so he should not longer be allowed to serve in a high office, no matter what. Whereas Ishaba Moon overlooks any type of sanctity or any other entity, he's only concerned about the sincerity of the returnee and assume, assuming that he is sincere, he did not mean the manner of return to in his, uh, or its time. On the other hand, Ishaba Moon place, places the issue of suspicion at the foundation of the law requiring the wait of a long period wherein the repentant is, uh, is meant to return gradually. In the end, after the waiting of a period and personal evaluation by the head of the episcopes, the man is allowed to return and to his position fully. It is true that Ishu Banun's ruling continues a long tradition from the early as the first uh, century uh, Christian sources, uh, since the church uh, canons required waiting periods for returning to various offices. However, as opposed to the Western Christian traditions, he doesn't, and Jacob Edisa also, they doesn't, do not 
mentioned the precise time spans required to, the, to, uh, to their opinion. In conclusion, we, uh, and in regard uh, to the waiting period, I would like to share an enigmatic answer with you. It is from the early 9th century and reflects the attitude of the Patriarch of Antioch toward, toward the phenomenon of heretics returning to Christianity. In the response of Kyriakos, uh, number, uh, the last uh, source in the handout, number 11, I think, uh, there, there are two explanations to the verse, the famous verse, uh, you shall not cook a kid in its mother milk. The verse from Exodus uh, 23 and other parallels. The second explanation he provides is that if a person becomes an heretic and returns to Christianity, he should not be accepted lightly, daily life, but should be required to undergo seven days of guidance. The author states that this guidance period is necessary so the repentant does not revert to his old ways. Once again, the suspicion and sincerity. This response is somewhat strange in it, and it's, it's exegetical backdrop is not entirely clear for me. Why does the metaphor of a kid in its mother milk indicate some, someone who returns from heresy? And why does Kyriakos design it a period of seven days, which is a short and significant period considering the goal of determining whether the repentance uh, is sincere or not? Could it possibly be an accepted custom of seven days, which needed to be attached to a scriptural verse? I don't know to answer, but I'm just raising uh, you the question. In any case, this response indicates that the fundamental need to provide the returnee to the Christian community with training, training and the concern about his reverting to old, his old ways. Additionally, the period of time mentioned here is significantly shorter than the duration required by other Christian authors. Perhaps this represents an attempt to easy the return, the return to the Christian community while following a frame uh, of a waiting time per, uh, period needed, albeit a symbolic one. In sum, Jewish and Christian sources we surveyed in the Islamic period in Mesopotamia deal with the phenomena of people who deviated from the community attribution and subsequently wished to return to it. To a great extent, the challenge of community <coughs> faced in such cases is similar to the challenge is faced it faced in cases of the converts who joined to the congregation community. However, the phenomenon of people who had been labeled Mishumadim or heretics or apostates and subsequently returned to the, uh, the new Jewish uh, is, is a new Jewish uh, is a new Jewish uh, discussion with Jewish literature and required the Geonim of Babylonia to think creatively. The central, concern, the central concerns of the, and sensibilities regarding this phenomenon are shared by the leaders of the Christian and Jewish minority communities in the Muslim realm. But the actions requirements and requirements stemming from these concerns are not always identical. We distinguish uh, between those who view someone who was an outsider and returned as inherently blemished, like Jacob of Edisa or Rabbi Gaon, and those who didn't view the reverting apostate as the Mish, like of Haigon or Ishubanu. On the other hand, among both Jews and Christians, there were those who maintained that the believer should be required to undergo the gradual process intended to test his sincerity, like Jacob of Edisa, Ishubanu of Amazon and of Palpatoy, and those who accepted uh, the repentant with open arms, uh, or at most with one only a symbolic ritual. The similarities and differences in practices raise right, the question of legal interaction between the communities, as was discussed uh, earlier. And however, I just want to point out that the strict opinion of Jacob of Edisa, which is the earliest surviving response in that regard, is unique and unparalleled in Jewish Germanic sources. While he located an unbridged border for the reversing apostate, most of, most of other writers in, in Jewish literature made this returning possible in one way or another. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. This is how it should be done. Uh, I think I think it's it's more than just uh, talking about influence. It's it's talking about thinking of a concept and thinking of uh, how to 
to societies living in the same historical context, thinking of the same problem uh, theologically, and what we can benefit from putting them side by side. I, as you know, my work, I fully agree with that reason. And I think in your time period, it's even safer and, and more clear because we're that the dating is, 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 is and obviously very clear. And, and again, not a single question about, you know, who read who, we don't need that kind of question. And there's enough to do, to do just by putting them side by side. Uh, just one one note about um, the seven day. You just said a sentence that it's a short period and it's not significant. I actually think uh, it's interesting. I, I worked a little bit on something, uh, someone similar. On, I wrote an article about confession in uh, Boundbridge and Festure. Uh, the need for confession, uh, public confession. Uh, and so there's a studia in, uh, in the Bavli and there's uh, in, in obviously in Christian uh, sources about the, the concept of public confession as part of, uh, of the need, uh, mostly for the community to see you admit your sin in front of the community and how the Bavli deals with it in, in, in the context of, uh, uh, of uh, when you do a, 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 a korban and, and, and uh, do, does everyone know why you're doing that korban? Do you, do you know what, what the sin you're, you're doing? So there's a whole, so I try to show in light of uh, um, Christian concept. So um, I don't know why I went there. Oh, because you have seven a source days. about confession, sorry. So I have a source about confession here. That seven I think days, is, seven days. I don't know, but I say you have, a, you have a source about confession here, which is interesting. And in the context of confession, that's one thing. And in the source, uh, the context of confession, the seven day is interesting. I don't think it's a short period. I think it's more um, a sociological question. When you look at the confession, you say, when does the person go and confess the sin? Um, they're very much aware of human nature. You can have a transformation. You can have a change of heart or something. And sometimes it's, it's, it's temporal, right? You would want to do a change and it's not permanent. And, and they're very much aware of that. And they're saying, if we're making that decision of allowing you to come back, we want to make sure that it's not something that is, um, you know, you're going to change your mind again tomorrow. You so seven days is not seven days to change. I mean, you could say you could be very passionate and change your mind after seven, after eight days, right? I, I actually, I actually, <laughs> actually saw this kind of like I, I saw three days and I saw so four days and in, in, in the context of confession, I think you should go to psychological. There's like you know, like there's short term memory, which is like there's a few like <laughs> the same thing about changing your mind of a decision. I'm sure I, I'm not an expert, but I saw when I dealt with confession that there is this short period of time surrounding your decision that they have this concept of, uh, you have that like around a, a, a meaningful event or a meaningful decision that you make, you have the, like a short amount of time where your emotion are at the high peak and you would more likely to change your mind and not change your mind. And you wanna make sure that you're not at that time period and you won't change your mind after. Of course, then you have to see, I don't know, a year, two years to see if it's six or whatever. But those, you, we do see that, that they're aware of the fact that there is a short time period uh, that you could do. I'm interested in seeing the Chalev Dibu Chalev Dimo because um, I don't know, I went with my head. I don't know, it's true. We have to see the, the going back to your to your own, you know, whatever. And this, like, uh, is it the same or is it not the same? The Gdim, the Chalev Dimo, I would go in that direction, but I, this is the Midrash. I have to see the, the actual context to see if that mm -hmm. helps. In any case, bottom line, wonderful paper. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Can I answer? Sure. Yes. Um, I'm not answering, I'm, I'm just uh, relating. Uh, of course, I'm very interested, in, in, interested, interested to, to see the, the sources and the text. Um, it is very interesting to think, what, of course, everything is relate, uh, related. Uh, what do you think is uh, short and long? Uh, my perspective wasn't uh, uh, as a judgment, it is too short, but the perspective of the uh, Christian uh, earlier sources, which speaks of about a, a year, two years, even four years, not the same thing, right? This is this is this is the long period where you check, like you know, Kahana this morning, Matan Kahana this morning wanted to check how much percentage a year after actually keep the commandment. That's one check. This is a different check. This is I'm coming back and I'm saying to you, I'm back, take so me. That, and that if you don't know if it's you know something. Okay, that was my second not. my second comment. I, I think we, we can uh, look at it uh, closer later. Uh, that uh, this uh, answer um, refers to not to the. Um, we do uh, confession back to the train to, to teach him from the beginning the, the rules and in that uh, in that uh, context i think that seven days may be oh, more symbol so let's stop here for a second and talk about public confession in ancient christianity so public confession and ancient confession can be 
uh, a ceremony in front of the whole community, but it can also be a confession in front of a, a, a representative of the church. But you go, that is considered public because you go to someone else and you confess. And in that regard, what happens between those two, there, there is like, we know what they do. They do go through a training. This is like a one-on-one. -on -one, and then they talk about how much you do. So there's different kind of public confession that you should, you know, we shouldn't just imagine. Thank you. For I just want to interject. And I mean, I didn't think of this before, but as Michal was speaking, so I was thinking, you know, the seven days, it's also, I mean, it's in the Christian sources here, right? Mm -hmm. Not in the Jewish yeah. ones, but it's very reminiscent of like Mitzola or Nida, you know, that it's like, it's a transition, right? Like after you return to the community, you have like a, a ritual seven days of, you know, I, I agree. Uh, the symbolic uh, uh, frame here is, is clear. I, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. And then, you know, if, if there is some parallel or, you know, maybe that's just like a way of, of signaling this person, you know, you can't just come right back in. You have to have, yeah. Um, some kind of, of uh, transition ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, Moshe, you wanted to add something? Yes, I have, I have. I'm checking regarding that. I have a med association about the seven days. Now you're telling me? All those years. Maybe the, um, because in, other, in, in some contexts, um, 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 a kid in, in his mother milk and the law regarding uh, let, let, a, let a young calf be for seven days with his mother before you may slaughter it, okay? Both are considered as, as mercy uh, towards animal, as a kind of a, and, and, and maybe since they are discussed together, that was the background for that, but you need to do some digging yeah. to see whether that's how. You marry well, a non-Jewish wife. You need seven days to uh, <laughs> away from something her. like so you need, Yeah, yeah. It's, it's as if like you need seven. Let, let's give him seven days in his mother with with his mother before he's coming back to us. Something like that. But actually, we didn't read the uh, the, the source, but uh, he uh, uh, explains. He used the uh, used the word. Uh, this is translation. Let's he returns again, uh, again, and wallows its mud, which is. I think yeah, this is wow. this was the, the explanation of the uh, in this uh, in the end of the answer is connected it connects it in a way to the to the verse. Uh, yeah. So the, the, this uh, imaginative uh, of. Uh, of the calf in, in, in the mud or something. Mm -hmm. this, this is the, the way I, I thought about it, but I, I need more to check. And, and about the um, um, ah. in, in, in source it is not really. And then especially <laughs> when it's a, an issue with the um, uh, original the Arabic, I think according to the context is, it's not Pesach that, it's when he was at the stage of, of, of being removed from that. It's not, it, it, Pesach that gives you more a sense of uh, shogeg. And I think here it's, um, the meaning is, is more that he was out of his mind. He was out of the right mind, out of... Uh, maybe I, I, I'm not, we will ask uh, our, uh, uh, our experts in, in uh, Judeo Abi, uh, the, the, the Hebrew is of uh, Mordechai Kiva Friedman. No, not, uh, don't not... start up with him. <laughs> 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 well, in, in, so, in, in Blau's dictionary, I found nothing that can help. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, anyway. Yes. yes. First of all, thank you very much. And, um, and I thought about the few days, maybe, I don't know about seven, right? But uh, <laughs> in Islamic law, right, same time, uh, development of, uh, like, it's already the ninth century, and there are already this more detailed discussions about what you do with apostates in born Muslims who are apostate to another religion or converts to Islam who wish to return. And uh, there are different opinions. I can't remember all of them, but I uh, think that like the general trend is that um, for <coughs> converts to Islam who try to return to their to Christianity or to Judaism, you need to give few days to think about it and then you should um, kill them, right? If they still want to, to come return to their original religion. Why? While born Muslims, their opinions are more into the, no, you can kill them immediately. 
Okay. With no, with no, uh, yeah, so of course, there, the are, there are varied opinions, but the point is it's specifically for or, or more, more stress Very on um, converts time. who now wish to leave us. We need to give them a period of thinking about it. Two days, three days. So it might be very long, seven days, very long <laughs> period, because the others give us three days and they have to power off the state. Okay. Perspective is everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very nice. Um, Adam. Um, cool. I, I'd like to return to the, the first comment. Um, I, I was, I, I would like to understand um, um, the issue of whether they were aware of each other to me, it seems very important um, if they're to where to which to, to to whether they're building on uh, rabbinic earlier rabbinic literature, are they in conversation with each other? Um, you know, that seems to be a you know, talk about for about Mishpat Ivri or, or a sort of classic Talmud study versus a historical approach. So, I, I, I would like to know more about. Um, especially the context of their apostasy. In other words, there are so many different halachot already in, in, in Chazal and, and certainly in the modern period, you know, about a person who is, uh, uh, let's say, Sanhedrin, Chaf, Vav, about Mumal Hachis, Mumal et cetera, et cetera. And it's all, so, and all those types of categories impact on the stature of the person, the stature of the, of the, the their, their uh, repentance process, the way the community looks at them, the degree to, where they're, to which they're considered to have left the community from a sociological perspective. So those things are, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just, you know, offer a little bit more in terms of some of like the, the Gaonian, um, you know, with, when, when um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty um, amazing quote from, from, from uh, Haigon here. Um, in, in, in source six, um, is he talking about the same type of people as, um, as source five or source um, seven? You know, that seems really important to me. Okay, so there was a few, few matters in your question. Uh, first of all, regarding to the, you mentioned the Meshumad Lachis and Meshumad Lachis and these categories, I, I can I can't say um, erased in the Gaonic literature because they are there, but um, they didn't function in, uh, in legal um, coding of the Gaonim because they uh, just ignored them in a sense. So uh, Gaonic literature who refers to the Babylonian Talmud is, uh, in, in the it's the exegetical or interpretations to the Talmud, of course, knows these categories and mentions them, but the Geonim themselves didn't use it when they refer to apostates, to the Mishumadim. Almost never, besides one category, which is the Mishumad, Chalel Shabbat Befaresia, which rose up from the, I know, I know, <laughs> yeah, and, and become the, the most uh, prominent uh, category for them. So th this is just a, a comment about this uh, sub-categories uh, of uh, apostates or much more. Um, I would like to know uh, more also, as you uh, would like, but uh, as far as I, as I know, as far as I, I look for, there's no, we have no uh, many, uh, much information about the interaction between these writers and leaders. Though part of them are really were close uh, in time and in time and space, uh, but we have some uh, some clues. There is a, a Christian uh, answer, I think, of the uh, Ishu Bocht, who lived in the beginning of the eighth century, uh, which uh, uh, mentions the, some something about the uh, Nomos Moses. Uh, about uh, about the inheritance of apostates, mm -hmm. and we have um, I think a, an, an, an unknown uh, writer, a Gaonic uh, writer that uh, uh, mentions uh, uh, so um, 
So there, there are some clues, but I can't say more. Unfortunately, I, I would like to, <laughs> to tie them in, in a way, but uh, we can just guess. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I, I was going to, I will say in my remarks that I think your comment about your observation that the Geonim are being creative here. In other words, there is not that much computically. I think it's absolutely correct. Just to respond to your particular point, Adam, Mumar is the low apostate, right? Mumar Lechalel Shabbatot is getting closer, right? So the same thing will happen. Again, that's not my talk. That I'm also going to hear more about these, these groups. I have to send it to the book. But, but the, the, um, in Christian Europe, uh, throughout the period of the Rishon, they struggle with the same questions. What can you extract from the Talmud or what can't you? And the fact is that the Gaonic policies on both sides here are, I don't mean extra Talmudic, that they're just ignoring everything, but they are certainly being very creative. Mm -hmm. And I think you made that point very well. Mm -hmm. I just had a, a question or a comment. Um, the, again, it, it's, it's almost uh, seductive to use the, the Kahuna issue to try to deepen the conversion issue, right? And it was the apostasy issue, right? Uh, the Kohen who can't come back. The fact is, of course, I think you said this, but I think you have to stress it even more because mm -hmm. um, Micha Perry wrote about this too. And I, I have some footnotes in the book where I think I think it's got to be rethought. Uh, it's a question of basic status as a Jew versus a privilege, Kihuna, right? Mm -hmm. To lose your basic status, that's really big. To lose your privilege, not, sure. not so uh, <laughs> remarkable. And I'll just to give an example. There, by the way, there is Talmudic data, Beit in other words, Kohanim who, Kohanim who, you know, go nuts. They are seen, shown the door, you know, they can't come back so easily. But here's the test case. You have discussion again in the medieval period, but they try to push it back. Um, but it is creative there too. Kohen Shaharagat nefesh. if a Kohen commits murder, can he bless the people? Hmm. A, a, a Israel who commits murder may be in big trouble, but nobody would say that they've, I mean, we might say, oh, they're not Jewish, but we mean that, you know, uh, societally, we don't mean that halachically. So that particular uh, uh, comparison, so what I'm trying to make is, you will find the kuhuna gives Geonim, not that there weren't actual cases, gives Geonim and Rishonim the opportunity to drop a lot of, uh, you know, I would say two team, but you know, in other words, they really talk to him. They're, they're really doing stuff here, but it, it's a free kick because that that issue is it doesn't cost them very much. It doesn't cost them very much, and it's beyond the, the basic Jewish status. Maybe. Th thank you for the comment. Uh, maybe, but the, the point is, on, on the other hand, um, Rav Haigon didn't um, disturb between this uh, uh, status. And he, he said, if, if you are uh, Israel, you are a coin. If, if you're not, you're not. And so, but but I, I got the point. So that that allows him just to make the extra point. But that's the basic mm -hmm. point is, is and, and, and largely speaking, as you pointed out correctly, there's almost no opinion, no matter what they want the returning apostate to do amongst the Gonium, which says, oh, you know, let's have them wait six months. There's no, there's no such thing. You know, mm -hmm. the basic status is, is preserved uh, very quickly. And, and then the question is just what's the penalty phase? You know, when I brought the, the, that, that dichotomy, it was really just an example of categorization. But nonetheless, I think in terms of our conference, it really raises this question of when you talk about converts, what do Gonim mean? What do uh, rabbinic, you know, earlier rabbinic literature mean when you talk so that you have these categories that we all talk about, Mumar, Mishumad, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, do you think these people were converts? Were they the, return? Were, were the people that are, is it clear that they went through baptism or they went through an Islamic conversion or, the, you know, in, in, and so, and, and is that what the Gonim are saying that, Maybe that's why the rabbinic traditions are not relevant because the rabbinic, the Talmudic understanding of these different identities, it doesn't have the type of binary that the medieval one has. It doesn't require that. The question is, is it relevant? It's, it's more of a, a kind of somewhere categorizing, you know, a pagan world type of sort of looking at things, not as much of a more um, uh, um, monotheistic kind of truth. I'm, I'm not sure I, I got all, all the, what you said, but 
you asked me if, if I think that they were, were like converts. Yeah, of course, and, and the definition of converts is discussed all the time. And the, defi the defi definition of apostates is that uh, in my dissertation, in, in a uh, book regarding uh, the later period, um, I, 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 th I, I can say that I, from what I, I see, the Geonim, uh, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish Geonim, um, didn't relate him as a convert because they uh, they point out that the genealogy is, is everything. And ge genealogy speaking, they, they were all, they were only returnees and not newcomers. And that was their point of uh, regarding the, Yibum, they're not Rav Haigon and Yibum, where he says that you can actually free a woman without if her uh, former husband was an apostate. He doesn't require her to give a gap. That's a famous, okay. right? The, the, that would the be question, a, a non That's another place where you have an extra kit because it's an unusual space. Okay. Michal, I think what's interesting about this conversation is that what do you do once you find this parallel, right? In, in, the, in the process. And that we, we found the parallel, you found beautifully that there is a parallel in the process, but we have to take it one step further. Otherwise, it's not interesting enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, if in the past, the question was who took from whom, and we're not asking that anymore. So what are we doing with parallels, mm -hmm. right? So that's the question. And I think the question of um, what did they have in mind when they did this and, and how, how does it relate to other processes that are similar, et cetera. I think that's where you should take your research and you haven't examined this enough in this paper, I think. And I think this is where, this is where the importance of finding parallel lies. Otherwise we're just doing, you know, uh, one of those collections of similar things, which is, by the way, I never thought that this was worth it. I think it's it's worth in itself because it just shows the milieu and the world that they live in. And that's, I, I told you your paper is wonderful and I think it, it should be done. But I think that the importance of your paper lies in the next step. And in questions mm -hmm. such as these, like what 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 stands behind the, the, the differences? And so you said that this is nice that you're showing differences. You know, J.C. Smith told us to do that in the 80s, and, and this is what we should do, right? The, the similarities and differences, and not focus just on, on, on influences. And I think this is and similarity and differences, not just in the process that you found, but in what it means. Why is it similar? Or why is it dissimilar? Of course, and, and the, the Islamic uh, uh, legal world is also absent from this paper. It is very important in that, uh, in that uh, time frame framing to, to check. I want to follow up on, on uh, the comment about the Kohen and the Israel also, because I think that that distinction also requires um, finessing a little bit in the paper what what is going on in terms of um, are these are these rulings responding to Mishumadim who want to return or are they acting as deterrents so that's also it's also a question mm -hmm. of the audience who is reading these sources right mm -hmm. um, and also a question of you know what's the reality like can we try and deconstruct um, the reality because I mean, I was just thinking like in terms of the, when you were talking about the Kohen, so, you know, I was just thinking about this because today's Daf Yomi talks about uh, a Kohen who married a widow. And there also, there's like, uh, you know, there's also in the middle ages, there's all kinds of um, knasot, how do you say it? Knas in English, Fine. like the terms. Fine. Yeah, but like, you know, like the, the same kind of thing that he can't um, he can't bless the congregation etc and and it's the same it's all part of the same family of Christ yes yeah, it's, it's more sanctions yeah. like it's and it's more so the question is you know there I think it's clear that it's a deterrent yeah. right um, but in the cases of the Mishumadim, maybe they want to bring these people back into the community and so you know they're, they don't want to create that degree of sanctions or deterrence so I think that that's something that needs to be a little you know, like you need to categorize a little bit more what's happening in each of these cases and you know group them according to the circumstances. I agree. In, in that sense, what a very important thing that I didn't uh, done here uh, is to to listen more to the questions than to the answer mm -hmm. because the, the uh, mostly the the questions give, give us the reality, mm -hmm. give us the 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 context, the social context, the needs of the people. Uh, and for example, the, the, the saints of Rabbi Gaon didn't preserve the, uh, the, the question that we don't know what is the reality. In, 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 in contrast to Rabbi Amadon, which answered a, a fully question, we can 
conclude some information for this uh, course. Um, I have to do Any other comments? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. So I think regarding the the definitions, right? Of the uh, is he really a faucet or um? So or first, let's say also you should. I mean, Jacob of Edessa, it's, uh, you know, late seventh century, the, the ways that still didn't part uh, with Islam, right? And Haigaon is 11th century. Um, and I think this, in this specific source of Haigaon, the, um, if I remember correctly, he's asked about someone who uh, and now he's, he, he's allowed to be Chazan Yom Kippur, okay? Mm -hmm. And Rav Haigon in his answer said that if he repented from eating a lot, that of, then of course he can be Chazan. And his example for why this is clearly so, he says, because look, even, I added the word even, the person who had a din, so it's clearly that um, we're not talking about Meshumad uh, you, you know, Besachadat, no, even a person who went out of the religion is allowed to come back and do everything as usual. So, of course, you're questioning, and I think, I'm not sure if uh, you've put it here in the no. quote, but it, it says, so So clearly, uh, I, I cannot see what's the question here. So he's, he, I, he says something, I cannot see the question here. The, the example is so clear, there's no need to, to say further on this case. Uh, something like this in the full fragment of what we have. <laughs> so I think at least in this uh, answer from Haigon, it's clear that he's talking about his example this drink is a full positive that theoretically wishes to return. We're running out of time, so let's take another question. Okay. Thank you. It was a very interesting paper. Um, I think that in the case of Haigon, it will also be helpful to look at Sa'ad Yagon. Now, in Saad Yagon's uh, exegetical works, and particularly in his introduction to his commentary on the Torah, uh, but also in his uh, philosophical work, um, um, yes, uh, he makes clear that this is a period of great perplexion in religion, his period. Mm -hmm. Uh, he uses the word chairin, the same word that Maimonides uses yet later for his die to the perplexed. It's the same, it's the same Arabic root. So in a period of perplexion, people try all kinds of things. He makes that very clear. That's why he's writing his commentary on the Torah, because people have lost their way and are sinking. He, he uses that metaphor. They are sinking in water. And he's not necessarily talking about people who are converting to Islam. He's talking about all kinds of people. And to see the development in your, in your sources, to see that Rav Haigaon is much easier on these people, he, he's much easier on them than, let's say, your earlier sources. Um, um. Yes, this suggests that this is because of the, of, of the same problem. That, that people are trying different things because they are in some kind of religious crisis. And tomorrow we will hear Marjana about the Karaites, but certainly they have their views about these people and how to draw them back into their Judaism. So I think you really need to also look at the internal Jewish debate in this respect in the later stages of your fascinating uh, exploration but to see your sources this way makes it very very interesting and, and very important thank you very much can i have a short one yes short <laughs> one. Uh, it's very interesting that saadia didn't refer to this specific question because yes. saadia is the first and not in that context uh, it wasn't the first in that context mm -hmm. uh, only uh, to Synthesize the whole sources, early sources, uh, uh, referring to apostates and can in giving sign something for grammatic. Exactly. And, but where, where, and he has a he has an answer and he refers to and he refers to it in the in the Faber also. Mm -hmm. yes. And it is not a, exactly identical, uh, but he didn't refer 
maybe he didn't got the question about uh, returning. I don't think he is deliberately ignoring us, probably. Oh, he, yeah. he didn't survive. He uh, uh, <laughs> but I, I, have, I have nothing to say about Sada in this specific case. Uh, yes. uh, but go through but, his exegetical <laughs> works, yes. look at his commentary <laughs> through Isaiah, Isaiah and Tehillim, uh, and, uh, uh, and other texts, and see exactly. whether there, in his exegetical works, mm -hmm. you may find some comments Relating to this question, I think you you may find some hidden comments. Oh, that, that were, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe you'll do it after looking at the Agadic uh, tradition, which <laughs> which I recommended <laughs> you ago, know, and you said you can't do it all, and you were right. You <laughs> Thank you very much.